Hi, it's Thursday, June 24th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Matthew's Gospel. Today we're in Matthew chapter 12. We're going to do verses 1 to 8. Yesterday we finished off chapter 11, which kind of makes sense. Um, and we ended yesterday with Jesus um, admonishing the cities that had not repented, even after Jesus had visited them and done great deeds of power and they still hadn't repented. Um, he also suggests that Capernaum is a little too sure of themselves, um, um, as if perhaps they are blessed by his proximity, right? Because he, he lives there um, and says, you know, no, no. No, you're not. Um, you, you don't get any special favor. Um, and, and then he reminds us, and I'll be honest, I, I think that Matthew reminds us. I think Matthew has taken this saying of Jesus and tucked it on here. I don't think that Jesus was 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 uh, railing against Tyre and Sidon and then taking the Mickey out of Capernaum and then suddenly turned around and said, oh, and by the way, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, I think that uh, Matthew has put that in there because we just sort of needed to be reminded um, that that Jesus calls us um, to come to Him that that our our burdens might be eased, that we might we might rest, um, and, and that this actually isn't hard, although it is challenging at times <laughs> and a little confusing at times. But to remember, to remind ourselves that, yeah, but this isn't hard, folks. This isn't hard. I mean, what Jesus wants to do is to ease our burden and give us rest. Wow. Um, every now and again, when I come up against something that I can't solve, it could be getting through something at an airport going, okay, am I supposed to go here? Am I supposed to go there? I don't, I, what? I'll stop and go, okay, wait a minute. Okay, this has been designed so that the average person can figure this out. In fact, it's been designed so, so somebody less than average in terms of comprehension can manage this. So let's not overthink it. Let's just make it simple. Okay. Yeah, you go that way. You follow the picture with the finger on it. Got it. Okay. Um, I do that from time to time. Uh, because uh, sometimes it gets all complicated and I get all wrapped up in the complexity of it and then, oh, this is really subtext for that and that's a hit in this. And that's maybe why Matthew put that little passage in yesterday um, to remind us that Jesus' yoke is easy and his burden is light. I say that because now I want to read Matthew 12, 1 to 8, and I have a couple of problems with it in relationship to what we read yesterday doesn't seem as easy as I thought it might be. Anyway, let's see if you, you, if you recognize it too. So it's Matthew 12, verses 1 through 8. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him or his companions to eat, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and yet are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, quote, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, end quote, you would have condemned you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. There you go. So, so where to start? Well, maybe you 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 understood this, um, for, but for some reason it, it it just it struck me today as I'm reading it. Um, Jesus isn't eating grain as he walks through uh, the field. Uh, his disciples are. So Jesus is speaking up for them, right? Um, so maybe there's something here for me, for any of us, in terms of a, about allyship. It doesn't have to be about us directly. I mean, Jesus could have said, well, talk to them. Jesus could have said, not my problem. Jesus could have said, mind your own business. Could have said any of those things. Jesus instead takes this moment and turns it, turns it into a teaching moment for the, for the Pharisees and for those of us who will hear the story later. Um, and maybe a, a teaching moment for the disciples too. I'm not sure. Um 
so I'm not suggesting that this is the way that we want to practice uh, alliance with others um, in the 21st century, that we sort of jump up and speak for them and turn their 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 moment into a teaching moment. Um, I think in, in today's, uh, if, if, if this were to happen to me, I would try to give space for the disciples to speak about why they felt they should be eating grain. And I would support them. And if asked, I might contribute, but I would let them have their voice. Uh, so it's not a, definitely a great example of allyship. But the fact is, Jesus is not quiet when his friends are accused. It's very minor, I know. But let, let's get into this thing. So, so Jesus... Basically, what it seems to me is that Jesus is saying to, to, to the Pharisees, uh, and, and we've heard him say things like this before, right? We've heard Jesus say, um, uh, you don't fast when the bridegroom has arrived. You feast when the bridegroom has arrived, right? There's this idea that when you are with God, you don't have to go through all of the rules, right? The rules are, are ways that we... Um, develop our relationship with God. We follow the rules, the Sabbath rules, the purity laws, all the, we follow all those things to get us closer to God. And Jesus is saying, you aren't going to get any closer to God than being right here with me. So you don't need the rules. You're as close as you can possibly be right now. So never mind the journey. You have arrived. Okay? Those rules are the journey. And Jesus is saying, you have arrived. And the reason I'm saying that is because that's what it seems to say to me uh, on the face of it on, on the text. But it's also the way that I have heard it preached many, many times. Uh, I have read it this way. I've had colleagues see it this way. Um, and, and, and good on them. Um, I struggle with it because you know, so what we're saying here is, is that, you know, Jesus is going, yes. So David and his companions, um, they ate in the bread of presence. Yeah, because, because they were hungry and they were with David. And by the way, let's remember that the Messiah that we're awaiting is the new David. So they love David. David, David's great. So if David can eat, David's companions can eat the bread of presence, well, surely Jesus' companions can have some grain, regardless of the rules. David's followers broke the rules. Jesus' followers get to break the rules because Jesus is David. More than that, the priests in the temple don't have to follow the Sabbath rules because they are there at the Ark of the Covenant. They are with the presence of God, right? There's this idea that the presence of God is here in the temple and they are in God's presence. Therefore, they don't need the rules. So when Jesus brings that point up, Jesus is saying, not only is, am I David, I am also God. Okay. So, and I believe that's what Matthew wants us to know. So they are with me. Um, therefore, they don't need the journey. They have arrived at the destination. Whether they know it or not, they're there. They don't need the journey. They don't need the rules. I've heard it preached that way. I get it. I, 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 I like the way Matthew sort of takes us uh, making Jesus into David. And then, and, then, and then Jesus is God. And so we can step up. Um, it's, it's a little bit of blasphemy before we go to a big blasphemy, <laughs> except that of course, as a matter of faith, I don't believe it's blasphemy at all. Uh, and by the way, blasphemy, that's one of the rules. That's part of the journey. We don't need the journey. We're in the presence of God. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting convoluted. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make a little space because here's my problem with that reading. In chapter 11, yesterday, Jesus did great deeds of power in Tyre and Sidon, uh, but they did not repent. And Jesus says, so you guys, <laughs> you're in trouble. Uh, he suggested that Capernaum was a little a little, uh, a little, smug, uh, like they would be elevated to heaven. And he went, no, you're not going, no, no, judgment, you're going to, you're going to Hades. Um, now, it's my wondering, but I, I do think the text suggests that they think that they're in good shape because of their proximity to Jesus. Jesus lives there. So we're good, right? No. So it seems to me that in chapter 11, Jesus says that proximity to him is not enough. You saw my deeds of power, but you didn't change. So it's not enough that you saw my deeds of power. I live with you. We all live in this community together. 
but you haven't changed. Proximity to Jesus is not enough. And yet now, it seems that it is. After all, <laughs> in this chapter, he is David. He is God's presence. Um, I, I struggle with that. And, and I can't believe that Matthew would put these two stories together in such proximity and, unless I was supposed to be jarred by it, right? Because it's confusing. It's confusing. Um, and, and it's frustrating. And, oh, wait a minute. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, maybe it's not as hard as I think it is. So what is it? What's the simple way through this? I, 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 I ask myself. And maybe it's the last, or second last line, verse 7. He's talking to the Pharisees, right? We've done this assertion. Jesus, David, Jesus, God. Um, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. Again, Jesus is greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, quote, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. If you had not known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. A lot of people assume um, that the God of the Hebrew Scriptures, what's sometimes called the Old Testament, is very uh, vengeful and about sacrifice and, and all the rules, 317 commandments and all that stuff. Uh, and that Jesus comes along and says, okay, we're going to take it a lot easier now, folks. Let's not worry about that. Um, and, and And sort of lifts us away from that God of sacrifice. But in fact, if you read the Psalms and if you read Micah and if you, all through the Hebrew scriptures, um, God regularly says, I, it's, I'm not interested in, interested in sacrifices, bird offerings. I No, no, in, in Micah, you know, then, then what, what should I do? Um, seek justice, love kindness, walk humbly with God. That's worth more than all the bird offerings, right? So, so we have heard it before, but Jesus is reminding of that and doing it by a quote. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Now, mercy for me, usually when you hear mercy, mercy is something that you offer uh, a prisoner about to be executed, uh, a, a criminal about to be sentenced. Rather than give him 30 years, we'll give him 10 years because we're showing mercy. The judge showed great mercy. The judge showed great mercy by releasing her. Uh, so we usually see it... Um, Mercy as applied to somebody who has done something wrong. And that's the right word to use here, but I think that we're meant to be a little broader with that and imagine mercy more like compassion. Um, so someone doesn't have to do something wrong. You don't have to wrong me for me to be merciful to you. Um, at least that's, that's how I'm hearing it in my ears today. What I hear is Jesus telling me, or God telling me, because we're quoting, um, Jesus is quoting God, um, what I hear is that I desire mercy, I desire compassion more than sacrifice. The Sabbath rules, um, all of those uh, mitzvahs, all those commandments, all those things we're supposed to do, those are basically little sacrifices, right? Um, and that's not what God is after, all these little sacrifices. Well, I wash my hands like this all the time to do this. It takes me extra time. That's kind of a sacrifice. I don't eat um, pork. Uh, that's kind of a sacrifice. You know, um, so sacrifice doesn't necessarily have to be uh, taking something of great value and handing it over um, without return. Um, sacrifice doesn't have to be burning a big piece of meat either. Uh, sometimes it can just be refraining um, so I think that we can read sacrifice for um, uh, uh, obedience to rules. And it's not that God is saying that obedience to rules is of no value. It's just saying that it doesn't, it's not what he's looking for. Right? So, so if obedience to rules and regulations help you in your relationship with God, they help you communicate your gratitude to God, your love to God. They help you tell God who you are. They help you listen to God speak to you. Right? So for me, for, for Sabbath and all sorts of things, they, they do those things. They, they help me grow that relationship. And that's wonderful, God says. 
that's what you're doing for you and good for you. If you want to do that, that's fabulous. But that's for you. It doesn't have to be for everybody because we're all in different places in our relationship. Right here, Jesus' companions, they're right there with God. They're as present with Jesus, as present with God as they can be. So they don't need as many rules to get there, perhaps, as, as I do. So I don't need to judge them. I don't need to judge anybody with the rules. I use the rules to help me in my relationship. That's maybe why there are so many of them. There's hundreds of them because, well, that rule's not working. I'll try, I'll try to follow this rule. I'll take those two rules together and I'm going to work on it a little bit more. Um, yes, I, and, I, and I can hear somebody say, yeah, but there are rules too, just to think, thou shalt not kill. That's not necessarily about how we get closer to God, although it is a way to get further from God, I suppose. Um, you're right. There are some rules that have to do with how we live together. Absolutely. But so many rules about how we grow our relationship with God. And God's not saying those are bad things, but God's saying that that's, that that's not what really matters to me. What matters to me is compassion. How do you show mercy? When do you let go of your privilege? When do you say, I can be a little less sure of the future if that's going to make all of us happier today? If that's going to make you less anxious? Uh, that's showing compassion. That's showing mercy. And the thing with that is you can't, you can't codify it the same way because each of us, we, we live different contexts. And by the way, we have different creative abilities. You may discover a way to be merciful and compassionate. Never occurred to me. And it has to do with, with your creativity, with your gifts, with your relationships. And that's why God wants us to keep working at it and we can keep growing in compassion. So, so it's that desire for mercy that really, truly matters. David and his companions, it's not that they were David it's that they were hungry. They were hungry. And so, sure, the bread of presence, uh, yeah, that it has a holy role to play. But they were hungry. That matters the most. Um, and, and, and for the priests, um, eating, eating on the Sabbath, well, yeah, they're working really hard <laughs> on the Sabbath. They're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Yeah, but the priests are. They're, they're, they're part of that mediation, that, that relationship with God. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I'd laugh all the time, although COVID is very different. Uh, generally speaking, I work a lot on the Sabbath. <laughs> um, <coughs> so, you know, it's, yeah, it, it's understanding context. These people are hungry. These people are in a different context. So when you look at, with compassion on, 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 on others, you recognize their need and you recognize their context and you recognize that it's not the same as your context and it's not the same as your need. And so rather than saying, well, I don't need that, so neither do you. Well, it's not hard for me, therefore it shouldn't be for you. When we, when we live mercifully, we go, oh my goodness, that must, be, that must be a challenge for you. How can I help? What can I do? I hadn't thought about that before. I'd not seen that point of view. Tell me more. How do I help? What do I do? That's the line that unlocks locks it for me. And so for me, this isn't about telling me how great Jesus is, um, although Jesus is pretty great. Uh, this is about um, reminding me that, I, that God wishes me to live mercifully. And by the way, if I look at Jesus, I understand a little bit how to live mercifully. So in this story, how do we live mercifully? Well, we do stand up for our friends. Uh, absolutely, that's that's merciful. But more than that, um, we don't simply um, look at the, those with whom we disagree or those who challenge us and go, none of your business, and walk on. No, no, we, we take some time. Jesus gives, gives the Pharisees stories that they hold dear, not to slap them in the face, but to open their hearts to help them understand. Look, it's in your tradition already. You already know this, he's telling them. He's already know, know, you already know this. So think about this. And if you really understood what God was saying, when God said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. So the men who ate the bread of presence with David, they were guilty of breaking the rules. 
but they weren't guilty to God. The priests in the temple who eat during, during the Sabbath, they're guilty of breaking the rules, but they're not guilty in the eyes of God. The people that you and I call guilty, that does not mean that God considers them to be guilty. Uh, each of us works on a relationship with God, and if we're wise, we can do it together. Which is why it's also a good idea not to start dividing people into guilty, guiltless, or however we divide them. Because when we actually are in this together, we can each help each of us on our own journeys. On our own journeys to get closer to God, to deepen our faith. Also on our own journeys as we try to imaginatively live compassionately. Not just follow a series of rules, but actually let mercy, let compassion be part of our decision making all the time. Because it turns out that God's not against sacrifice. If it's good for you, if it, if it helps you show your gratitude to God, then that's lovely. But it's not what God's looking for. God's looking for compassion. Which I'm going to suggest to you was not what Jesus was seeing in Tyre, Sidon, or Capernaum. Um, so it does, it's not proximity that matters. It's compassion. And it's changing from how you are to what you can be compassionately. And now I'm going back to yesterday's meditation, so I'm going to stop right there. Okay, that felt a little sermony. Um, I will confess that right up front. Um, but I really was wondering with you pretty much in real time on this one. Um, yeah. And I'm going to think about it some more today. I hope there's something in this for you to think about. I hope there's something in this for you to share with somebody else and think about it together and, 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 and discover things that have not even not even wandered across my mind at this point. Because um, I know when I come back to this again another day, it'll have something new to say. For now, let me offer a prayer. Loving God, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to wonder. Thank you for the reminder that Jesus' yoke is easy and the burden is light. Sometimes we don't need to try so hard. Sometimes it's simple. It's about compassion. Sometimes. So God, thank you for all that we have learned today, all that we wonder today. May our learning, may our wondering bring us closer to each other. And may it bring it closer to you. We pray through the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's it for me today, but I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Until then, God bless you. And you already know what that means, right? God bless. <laughs>